Dzień dobry Państwu. Dzisiaj mam przyjemność i zaszczyt powitać Państwa, a przede wszystkim profesora Michaela Kuna, naszego wykładowcę, na wykładzie zaproszonym z zakresu badań polarnych Invited Lecture on Polar Research. Pan profesor Michael Kuhn przyjechał do nas z Innsbrucku. I would like to welcome uh, Professor Michael Kuhn. It's great honor and pleasure for us that uh, you could come to us and lecture within our series invited lectures on polar research. If you allowed me, I would like uh, to present uh, uh, you uh, in a couple words in Polish. Professor uh, Michael Kuhn ukończył studia na Uniwersytecie w Innsbrucku z zakresu meteorologii, klimatologii oraz hydrologii. Studiował także meteorologię i fizykę na Uniwersytecie Michigan w Ann Arbor. Badał wzrost kryształów lodu morskiego na dryfującej stacji na Oceanie Arktycznym w 1964 roku, a także spędził zimę, prowadził badania w czasie ekspedycji zimowej na Plateau Station w Antarktyce, gdzie badał przepływ energii przez warstwę graniczną. I to było w latach 1966-1968. Po uzyskaniu doktoratu z meteorologii w 1971 roku został później profesorem nadzwyczajnym, a następnie profesorem zwyczajnym meteorologii i geofizyki na Uniwersytecie w Innsbrucku. Warto wspomnieć, że stworzył on austriacki inwentarz lodowców w 1998 roku. Także badał, bada nadal ewolucję pokrywy śnieżnej w Alpach z wykorzystaniem różnych metod, w tym lasera lotniczego, co będzie przedmiotem dzisiejszego wykładu. Profesor Michael Kuhn był prezydentem Międzynarodowej Komisji Śniegu i Lodu. Był także sekretarzem generalnym Asocjacji Meteorologii i Nauk Atmosferycznych. Był jednym z wiodących autorów trzeciego raportu Międzyrządowego Panelu do Spraw Zmian Klimatu. Profesor Michael Kuhn jest członkiem Austriackiej Akademii Nauk. Mam przyjemność zaprosić profesora Kuna do przeprowadzenia wykładu. Today we have a chance to listen on recording and modeling alpine snow, ice and water at the basin scale and at high resolution. Professor Kuhn is the leading author of this uh, presentation. Dear Mike, floor is yours. The area that uh, the area of this study was the province of Tyrol in Austria and uh, South Tyrol in Italy. You have the main divide of the Eastern Alps, where you see the high concentration of glaciers, and you have a dry area that is well screened from north and from south uh, below there. Mountain peaks go up to 3,900 meters and the valleys are at 200 respectively uh, 500 meters of elevation. The distribution of glaciers that we investigated is given here in a color scale that indicates a, in dark blue glacier cover of more than 50 percent and in gray the uh, uh, ice-free areas. There is a uh, concentration of basins in the wet east and in the dry west and we will uh, sh show the or we will see some results of a number of small glaciers in this area on the fine scale. These four glaciers have a long history in glaciological research, particularly because Fernat Ferner used to be a surging glacier that went all the way down to the valley 
dam, the river, and the lake was developing here that finally burst the ice dam and inundated the valley. So we have records from the behavior of this glacier since 1602. And that is Hinter Eisferner, uh, the, the, the house glacier of my institute, and Gepatschferner, which is more like a large plateau glacier with a small top and Kesselbandferne, which is also uh, a glacier with very high variability. The measurement of precipitation uh, at a good weather station is difficult enough. If you go to the mountains, you face many problems. Most of all, uh, much of the precipitation is snow. And snow is aerodynamically not easy to catch in the rain gauges. And second, if you have a few stations in the mountains and you want to interpolate that in order to establish or calculate a, uh, a basin precipitation, then you cannot apply uh, standard methods like inverse distance interpolation because of the small-scale topography. So we decided to determine a basin precipitation from the water balance. We have good long-term uh, aging stations, and uh, uh, the runoff has an annual value of the order of 1,500 millimeters while evaporation is rather between 200 and 300 millimeters only. So if we make a certain mistake or error in the modeling or parameterization of evaporation, it is not a large <coughs> fraction of runoff or of uh, precipitation. Then we have the term of storage, which is uh, established from three glacier inventories, 69, 97, and 2006. These three uh, glacier inventories give us two periods with a uh, reliable change of uh, storage in the basins. I call them period one and period two. The analysis was based on uh, rectified aerial photography in the first two glacier inventories and on airborne laser scanning in the third one in 2006. Note that uh, in an uh, orthophoto you have many shades of gray and green in the, uh, the surrounding area and also on the glacier. It is not always uh, simple to determine the order of a glacier. But if you go to uh, digital elevation models, which we <coughs> established of all three inventories on this resolution of uh, one meter, you have much more information on the shape of the glaciers and on the old moraines that exist. So this is a very good uh, basis for calculation of uh, changes and balances. From 69 to 97, from the first to the second inventory, uh, we had the uh, melting uh, or volume uh, surface lowering <coughs> of the glaciers of more than 75 meters in, the, in this uh, color scale. And we even had some accumulation, net accumulation, in the upper part of uh, smaller glaciers. Hinta Esferner is a thick glacier. It moves fast and it transports any surplus rapidly to the top. Not so in small glaciers, <coughs> where the annual motion is small. So. Uh, any surplus that is established in the upper part of the glacier is not transported immediately or rapidly to the lower part. That may explain some of these uh, uh, different behaviors. Note that uh, the large glaciers do not change 
their, vol their area rapidly because these tunnels uh, may have a, a depth or thickness of 100 meters and more. So while you have a surface lowering and a loss of volume, you do not have much change in area. Uh, I have taken two mountain groups, Ötztal and Zillertal, from the Austrian glacier inventory in the first period. This is the glacier area in a, uh, a logarithmic scale and the relative change of area in percent. Again, the large glaciers of 10 to 15 square kilometers did not change much. It's about uh, 10, minus 10 percent, minus 5 percent. But at the other end of the spectrum, you have the very small glaciers of less than a tenth of a square kilometer, where several of them disappeared completely, minus 100 percent and several stayed almost unchanged in this period. Why is that so? If we look at very small glaciers, like this Surt Glacier at an elevation of 2,400 meters, we see that it is nourished by avalanches from its surrounding and by wind drift across the crest here. Uh, approximately a multiplication of uh, precipitation by a factor of five. So that is the reason why it can survive in full sunshine. On the other hand, if you do not have the cert walls, then you get, do not get this multiplication. You simply get some avalanches from above. And that is why even at an elevation of 3,100 meters, this glacier now is rapidly decaying. So that is an explanation for the different behavior among the small, very small glaciers. In the uh, Little Ice Age, we had several periods of advances. I must explain this, uh, this uh, graph to you. This is the change in Northern Hemisphere temperature relative to the period 1961 to 1990, relative to this period here. And we have an instrumental record since 1900 approximately, and that is given in red. And we have reconstructions of the uh, uh, temperature from various sources in blue and behind that we have the in gray shade we have the uh, uh, reliability of these reconstructions so you see the first uh, cooling uh, is often taken in 1450 uh, 1350 as the beginning of the little ice age and around 1850 at the end of the little ice age here we have a, a cold period around 1900 and around 1960 to 80. So that means <clears throat> that we can expect some uh, moraines from this uh, period. In, these, in this uh, picture you see uh, a glacier that apparently in the Little Ice Age was much larger than today. But in 1920, it developed a moraine of about uh, five meters height. And again, in 1980, a second advance that was almost parallel to the old moraines. And you can imagine that these large moraines of the Little Ice Age uh, were a mechanical barrier to uh, uh, following advances. So uh, it is not easy to reconstruct climate from such a large moraine that was a limiting glacier extent to follow the temperature and precipitation. Yeah, at the time of the last advance, we had good measurements of glacier velocities. And you can uh, observe that around in the late 1960s, when the cold period 
the intermediate cold period started. Glaciers reacted with a faster flow and finally again in the early 80s, but that was suddenly stopped by the warming of 82 and 83 that continued until 2000 or so. It's not only the, the local uh, effects that we have to take into account, also the position uh, of the uh, glaciers with respect to the uh, outside of the Alps. Uh, we have uh, a so-called dry interior where the northern calcareous Alps uh, and then uh, screen precipitation from the northwest and uh, where the Dolomites and other groups screen precipitation from the Mediterranean. So if you look at the winter precipitation as it was uh, modeled or presented by the Histop program, you can tell that in the uh, part of our in our investigation area you have a maxima of uh, precipitation and winter precipitation maxima in uh, uh, the northern side and you have uh, the adriatic influence in the south uh, east but a large dry area in the center of the uh, of the area <laughs> that is an effect of the screening. Another uh, interesting effect is that uh, uh, in the Mediterranean, we have a dry summer followed by a wet fall, wet October, November, and uh, preceded by a wet uh, May. In the northern Alps, or in the uh, northern areas, we have uh, a summer with uh, high convection and precipitation, and that is followed by a dry golden fall <coughs> north of the Alps. If you look at the graph that is following here, you have the stations in the north and stations in the south, and this is approximately the center, the main divide of the Alps, and uh, these are precipitation, the uh, daily values of precipitation from 1931 to 60. And you see the summer maximum in the north uh, continuing uh, to the main divide, where it is split in two maxima in November and in May. That, of course, is reflected also in the nourishment of the glaciers of this area. Now let us uh, make a first attempt to determine precipitation and its distribution in that area. Red and brown colors mean dry and blue is precipitation in excess of uh, 2,500 millimeters per year. So this is why we call this the, the wet southeast in this part, but we have a, a uh, an area that goes through the Alps that is a uh, relatively dry area with precipitation in uh, the range of 700 to 1000 millimeters per year only. If we now look at the runoff at the same period, we discover or we expect that rain is the most important contribution to the runoff, and that is true. But we also discover that small glaciers or small basins, like these two here, uh, with the runoff in excess of 2,000 or 2,500 millimeters per year, uh, have uh, additional supply of water from the melting of glaciers. And that is a relative contribution. In dry areas, the importance of uh, melting of glaciers is larger than in wet areas. 
look at a comparison of central dry stations in yellow and eastern wet stations in uh, purple. In the next graph, you can tell the percentage of ice cover from 0 to 40 percent and the uh, uh, percentage change in runoff in these two, between these two periods. Uh, the yellow from the dry central area is a stronger change in runoff, stronger relative change in runoff than those of the glaciers in the wet area where precipitation is higher. And it's not only glacier and, and not glacier alone. In unglacierized areas, you have changes in runoff as well because precipitation may change. Generally, you can distinguish a glacial uh, type of runoff with peaks in July or August, no matter whether that is a wet area like the red curve or a dry area like green and blue. It is indicating predominance of glacier melting. On the needle type, you have uh, early peaks of, of uh, runoff in May or in June, which is an indication that it is only snow melt that counts here. So you will <coughs> better understand the following curves where I show the uh, monthly values of runoff in red of uh, rain in blue or precipitation in blue and storage in green. This apparently is in the unglacierized area and it is in the dry interior and has a maxima of uh, precipitation in July with 150 millimeters per month and 120 millimeters in November. By the way, all of these stations have secondary or primary uh, maxima in November in the precipitation. Uh, green is the storage. That means in winter we have base flow in the rivers from the groundwater. We have a storage of uh, water in the snow cover and release of that in spring when snow is melting. And then the summer precipitation and fall precipitation again fills the, the storage reservoir. That leads to a runoff with the peak in, in uh, May. So these two here, uh, while they're differing in uh, the amount of precipitation, are definitely of the needle type. The glacial type in the wet area and in the dry area uh, shows a maximum in July. And there's a runoff up to 700 millimeters per month. The shift of the uh, regime is a, from uh, the first to the second period is about one month. In the warmer second period, we have earlier snow melt, earlier increase in runoff in both of these uh, basins. Uh, the uh, increase in precipitation or the change in precipitation uh, is not significant. We have two peaks in the in the first period and one peak in the uh, second period. The earlier start of melting and the increase of precipitation in fall should be uh, noted. Here I have made an attempt to balance only liquid water in the basins. That means I take runoff, rain but not snow, melt water and evaporation from the liquid uh, water which yields the change in liquid storage. And it is interesting to see that the uh, we have, a, generally, we have a base flow, as I just said, in the winter months, fall and winter months. 
and the, that then meltwater story sets in when snow is melting. That is not only in, it's in the form of groundwater, but also in the snow cover. The snow cover may uh, contain uh, meltwater or retain meltwater in large amounts. But then when the snow cover is melted, it cannot retain the water, so it has to release it. And then summer precipitation increases again. <clears throat> The interesting thing in both of these basins is that while we presently, or in the second period, we have two uh, different distinguished peaks. In the first period, we had only one, and that is because meltwater was stored later and coincided with the peak of precipitation uh, in the summer months. So there is a significant significant shift between the two periods in uh, liquid water storage. We can conclude the first part of the basin balances, uh, noting that uh, we have a significant change in or marked change around 1900 and that the increase in precipitation uh, in runoff that follow that change in the second period may amount to more than 30%. It's important to note that there is no linear simple relation between temperature change and runoff change or uh, precipitation and runoff change. And that even at small scale, we have large differences in the behavior of the glaciers. Let's go to the smaller scale, the, the glacier scale uh, in between. If you need to, to determine the uh, specific mass balance of glaciers, we have several choices. This is the result of geodetic measurements, that is changes of surface elevation. And uh, it shows the uh, mass balance of glaciers in period number two, only specific, that is only on the glacier, not basin wide and the uh, some uh, basins with very small low laying glaciers have the largest losses of more than three meters water equivalent per year and others uh, had uh, uh, intermediate values around one meter of uh, water equivalent per year which is typical in the entire Alps. How is uh, the distribution of uh, specific balance with altitude? We can tell that in the lower part uh, of uh, this glacier, we have a very regular change with output elevation, which is determined by temperature and radiation. And then we have a part that is irregular and is mostly determined by topography. In uh, plateau glaciers, this is uh, different. This is Engabrein in northern Norway, uh, where we have again losses of minus uh, of 10 to 12 meters per year at the tongue, but a very regular behavior almost to the top. And that is because this is a, a uh, Plateau glacier that does not appear. Okay, I'm sorry, but uh, you will believe me that Engabrein is a is a plateau glacier with a flat top and no topography. I, I said that, that I was using the geodetic method. Traditionally, we, we have the so-called direct method or glaciological method that works with uh, uh, snow stakes and snow pits. It uh, refers only to the surface and the snow stake travels with the ice. Uh, that means that we have uh, really the specific surface balance. These are examples for the 
results interpolated from the point measurement of the direct method. Uh, take a look at the year 2007, where we had losses of uh, five to six meters at the tongue and uh, gains of up to uh, one meter in the upper part of the glacier. And that makes for a strong difference between the Appalachian area and the accumulation area. Then we take the geodetic method, which always takes the surface elevation of the entire glacier. And that means not only the melting at the top, at the surface of the top is recorded, but also the uh, uh, melting at the lower surface of the interface between ice and rock bed uh, is recorded. And then, of course, the motion of the ice that replenishes the losses uh, is also uh, measured as a surface elevation. And that is why we have less difference, not the red to dark blue, but the yellow to gray, because part of the losses on the tongue are replenished by ice motion. We come to the uh, fine scale now in order to explain uh, the behavior of the snow cover and the redistribution of the snow cover on the glaciers in winter. Uh, you know the method of laser scanning, the present state of the art is that we can have more than one value of uh, per square meter and uh, an accuracy of uh, plus minus 15 centimeters in flat areas that is less than 40 degrees. And that accuracy is necessary if you want to uh, uh, follow the redistribution of snow on the glacier by wind, by avalanches and by settling. The ALS uh, sees the surface tells the time it takes from the signal to return for, from the airplane to return from the snow surface. And uh, we want to have a picture of the surface elevation in October before the start of the accumulation period and later at the end of the accumulation period. Uh, in October, we may have uh, bad luck because uh, sunny October after the first ALS flight may induce more ablation. And uh, during the winter, the ice is moving and the snow or the fern in the accumulation area may still be settling. So in order to really interpret uh, accumulation, seasonal accumulation from two airborne laser flights, you need to more to, to need you we need to know more and that is the settling of the snow that existed in October and the melting that may occur in in October and of course the vertical ice motion that shifts the uh, uh, the surface downward in the accumulation area and upward in the ablation area so uh, uh, in, in, if you want to determine the, the uh, uh, mass balance on, from airborne laser scanning, you always have to take into account the, these three effects, and you always get only a total mass balance of the glacier and not a point mass balance that you would go get with the direct measurements, because the ice is moving in the meantime. This was discovered long time ago by Finsterwalder, who made the first uh, valuable or valid graph of the motion of ice, of the change of the surface in the accumulation area and the melting in the ablation area. And if you put a uh, stone somewhere on the uh, glacier surface, it will follow 
uh, the, the dashed line and turn up here and contribute to the buildup of moraines. So that was a good idea by Finsterwalder. And we have to uh, try to apply these principles to the evaluation of ALS measurements. In the uh, accumulation area, we may have, in October, we may have uh, the ice, of course, and several layers of fern and fresh snow from September or whatever. And that is, with, in, in the winter, that is moving uh, downward in the accumulation area. So you have a lower ice surface and you have a compressed layer of fern and snow, and you may even have some ablation. But in May, you measure uh, the uh, winter snow that has been deposited on top of the moving ice. So the difference between October mo surface model and, uh, and May surface, that is what we see from the airborne laser scanning. But in reality, accumulation is larger because the uh, ice and the fern has been moving, submerging, and uh, settling. In the uh, lower part, the same is shown for the uh, ablation area where ice is moving, emerging from the surface, and you may even have some ablation in between. <clears throat> so again, the signal from the laser scanning is not the accumulation that we want to know. So that means if we want to interpret or analyze uh, laser scans, we need to have more information. Information on the accumulation and information on the, excuse me, information on the ice ocean and information on the, on the settling. The uh, snow accumulation uh, was determined by using geo radar, ground penetrating radar mounted on the motor sled. And in the following slide, we see the results of one of these uh, campaigns. This is Kesselwand Ferner. You have Fernacht Ferner and Gepatsch Ferner here and there, and uh, Hinter S. Ferner below that. It is uh, the result of the uh, of a laser flight. The changes in surface elevation are color coded here, and the the hatch area indicates the area that is covered by fern. So here we have the substrate that is fern and the annual accumulation. The surface elevation changes. Uh, are given in this color code and the uh, ground penetrating radar in the same uh, color code here indicates the thickness of the seasonal snow cover. So if we go to this point here, the surrounding is about yellow, we have a, an increase during the winter of 1 meter 50 and the snow cover thickness at this point determined by radar is in the blue scale which is around two meters 50. so there is one uh, <coughs> one meter uh, difference in the two that means the submergence has been one meter <coughs> results from kesselwand ferner uh, show the difference between the snow height in green and the surface change in red. We have the elevation of uh, the surface 3,300 meters here and 3,000 meters at the right end of the picture. You see that in the upper part that is uh, fern covered, that is accumulation area, the snow depth in green is always larger than the change of the surface elevation. So it was submerging here and definitely 
uh, it was the other way around at the end of the glacier where uh, uh, emergence uh, increased the surface compared to the uh, snow cover. These peaks here are uh, crevasses that were open in October, maybe 20 meters deep or so, but were snow covered in May, so it gives an increase at this local point. The same again for a case where we have a change of snow cover, and even at the small scale, we see that uh, snow depth is larger than the change of surface elevation in the snow covered areas and is nearly identical in the rest of the glacier. Two examples of uh, extreme uh, changes in surface elevation. This is a view of Gepatschferne uh, and its tongue. That's the accumulation area of Gepatsch. That was Kesselwanferne that we just looked at. And you see the small or narrow tongue, which has a thickness of 100 uh, meters and a speed of about 50 meters per year. And uh, the color scale gives you the accumulation from October 2010 to May 2011 in a color scale, or in, uh, starting with 2, two meters 50. Anything that is less than 2 meters 50 is net not colored here in order to give a better view of it. So first of all, we see at the lower end of the steep slopes, we see that there are moraines, uh, excuse me, avalanches uh, very regularly. And you probably we have wind drift in these places <coughs> where in a generally flat glacier, you have some uh, undulations. And then there is the moving town with uh, open crevasses, which uh, uh, are uh, again visible here. So this is the profile, as the black profile here, going about 700 meters along. The blue is the surface in uh, October 2010. Red is May uh, 11, uh, 2011. And you can tell by the shift of these crevasses or uh, undulations, which are not filled with snow because they are too wide, that uh, the profile shifts by about 50 meters per year, which is equivalent to the rate of ice flow. In a similar way, it was true on Gepatschferner. Uh, now we can uh, interpret that much faster. These are the areas of large crevasses that were moving that, in, that uh, induced the surface elevation changes. And here we have again a number of places with avalanche deposits at the lower end of steeper slopes. And apparently the largest crevasses uh, moved by about uh, 40 meters per year and were uh, 20 meters deep. I, I repeat that the changes in accumulation are due to wind drift, avalanches, and melting. And uh, we can tell that uh, from the repeated ELS flats. We have five years here, and the Glacier we see is Kesselwandferner, that was with Natschferner and Hinteressferner. And the color code says uh, any changes, extreme changes, which means 1.5, uh, the average, 1.5 times the average uh, snow height uh, is uh, in, uh, occurring in any one of the five years. At the end of, of uh, a glacier where ice is moving, or at the foot of this cliff <coughs> where avalanches are uh, falling, we may have these extreme changes in every year. Finally, a view on the distribution of the snow cover, snow height. 
that is a, 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 a diagram or a graph that uh, shows the elevation from 2,200 to 3,800. And these are the observed snow heights uh, in meters for five years indicated down here. So you see a, a, a large difference between uh, relatively dry years and years with plenty of precipitation. There is a part in the glacier where snow cover is thick and at the lower part or outside the glacier and the upper part of the glacier is uh, not so thick anymore. Here we have an indication of what fraction of the area is covered by snow and the colors again indicate the, uh, the uh, year of observation. Finally, the, the size of the triangles indicates the uh, uh, relative contribution to the snow cover in general. Same uh, picture uh, displayed in a different way is the observed or uh, measured snow height in meters and the uh, area on the glacier where this snow height, this accumulation was observed, a uh, value of zero snow height in May is of course very frequent at the lower part of the glacier and then we have that area that we just saw in the middle of the glacier with plenty of accumulation in the flat parts. Now, the five years here are difficult to interpret, so we can standardize them and uh, make the difference between the observed and the mean of that year and divide it by the uh, standard deviation of all the individual measurements. If you do so, we find a much more regular uh, way of comparing the uh, snow depth and of telling any extreme values. The last few slides summarize what we just said. We see the standardized snow depth for five years, averaged over five years. And again, we see the uh, values in excess of two meters at the end of the glaciers, at the uh, moraines and at the, the steep walls surrounding the glacier. And we can also tell the wind drift along the crest that uh, goes across here. On the right side, uh, the standard deviation of the five years that were used in this graph is given here. And then we can tell these two profiles, obviously influenced by avalanches in the next slide. And that means the surface profile is uh, given in the dotted line. And you have the uh, uh, snow height along the slope given here, the lower value and a, uh, an increase, a sudden increase at the foot of that slope, which obviously is connected to avalanche activity. Why uh, in the second profile we have much larger undulations here and a very sharp peak uh, of avalanche deposit followed by a, a smaller one uh, is not easy to interpret and I have to remind you that we still do not understand everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for questions, uh, comments, discussion. The floor is open. So, may I start with, if you permit, uh, I have a, a, a list of uh, 
questionable remarks, but uh, in going to the second part of your uh, lecture, um, I, I'm a bit surprised, but this one meter of submerging uh, and settling uh, of the upper part of glacier, mm -hmm. I think is uh, substantial value per year. Yeah. Uh, did you prove it by velocity measurements using uh, accurate uh, GPS system, placing stakes and measuring uh, precise velocity and elevation change? That was done in the case of uh, FNAP China, but not in the case of uh, that I showed. But the, the, the submerging of one meter per year is acceptable. Is acceptable. It's not uncommon. So, uh, if it was uh, uh, just proof, uh, may, maybe my uh, uh, Svalbard perspective is uh, saying slightly different, but uh, I think it's quite a substantial number. Uh, one thing more, is it, uh, could you... Uh, uh, you mentioned that also uh, basal melting was taken into uh, account in a general water balance. Uh, it, it was done using some standard uh, uh, internal heat flow or... No, no, no. We, we observe water uh, melting at the... Uh, at, the uh, at the base. At the... The rock interface, ice rock interface, but we have very few measurements of that. And uh, one of the reasons why we think it is important is that we have seen uh, irregular sinking of the surface, which probably comes from uh, meltwater rivers entering the glacier from the sides mm -hmm. and melting out the ice underneath. Ah, I understand, yeah. So, uh, my list is very long, but uh, it's a chance for a larger audience to take a part in the discussion. Marius? Um, regarding the mass balance uh, method, did you include in uh, the mass balance uh, calculations the internal uh, accumulation and the water that is percolating down and freezing? Uh, and if it is included in the mass balance, uh, what is the contribution of the internal We checked that long time ago in our series of measurements at Hinta Espana by repeatedly making pits in the accumulation area and uh, going even in last year's accumulation with, that we had measured a year before. And we did not find any significant increase in, in density or so. So we, we did not uh, follow that anymore. We did it several times in order to get to make sure, but it apparently it does not uh, play any significant role. May I ask uh, uh, it is possible to say how is the much stronger accumulation of uh, snow during the uh, average year uh, in the vertical profile? It is how much and uh, what is the maximum level? It's about 3,000 or 3,500 because maybe exists in the Alps also uh, Precipitation you, mean the, you mean the precipitation? Uh, unfortunately, we do not know that. Mm -hmm. We have no reliable measurement of uh, precipitation. We have totalizing gauges mm -hmm. up to 3,000 meters. But they have, uh, uh, well, they are they're working all year and they are uh, protected against wind blowing in and they have a layer of oil on top so that there's no evaporation. And from uh, that, we found that, uh, for instance, uh, the accumulation 
on a glacier, on the glacier, in the same altitude than the rain gauge outside mm -hmm. the glacier on the, on the slope was a factor of two larger than the rain gauge. So that means uh, wind uh, during precipitation and after snowfall is collecting snow into the basin of the glacier. So, so maybe values about three meters up to maximum six meters yes. are possible. Yes. Because what what uh, your opinion about the snow measurement measurements, for example, on the Zondrick station? Because uh, in some reports I have seen even values more than 10 meters of snow cover. It is possible? It yeah, is possible. It is possible. Particularly close to the ridge, mm -hmm. where you have uh, cornices and where you have wind drift. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. And uh, you, you mentioned the increase of precipitation with the uh, elevation. Uh, from the modeling we did, in order to uh, reproduce the runoff, we had to increase precipitation by values of uh, 5 to 10 percent per 100 meter. And that is depending on the time of the year. It's stronger in winter where you have advective precipitation and less in summer where it's mostly convective. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Following up on the two other questions. Um, as if I understood well, the storage of liquid water was calculated from the budget of the other components, is that right? Yeah. Uh, so, what is the error that the, the other bodies contribute to this estimation? How the, is the error uh, is difficult to, uh, to uh, determine. We used the Monte Carlo method and changed all ingredients by a certain percentage. And uh, it, uh, it was a, an error of about uh, 50 millimeters per month. Mm -hmm. But that's statistics. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Cut it up later. I understand that the thermics was not the aim of this your presentation, but I'd like to ask what is the type, the thermic type of those clusters? Are all of them polythermal clusters that you present? Or uh, uh, warm gases. Temperate pressures. Temperate There is no cold ice. Uh -huh. uh, we used to have a limit of 3,400 meters for cold ice on the north slopes uh, in that area, but that was in the 1970s. And now most of these north faces have uh, started to melt, and some of them even have uh, made ice avalanches and disappeared. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In the, I, I don't know of any cold ice in the eastern Alps anymore. Even in the very thin glaciers, glacier it is. If, even if uh, the glacier is very thin, there is no cold ice at all? No. no. That's a good question. <laughs> Nobody cares about thin glaciers. <laughs> <laughs> Because it, it, could, it could well be that if you have a remnant of a glacier that, let's say, is, is five meters mm -hmm. thick or so, that you get winter cold down to the base. Mm -hmm. I mean, those those couple of shot of a couple of them you shot on in the slides, the small, very high, high located, mm -hmm. small glaciers or steep glaciers are probably very thin and. It gives the possibility to penetrate the cold through, through the ice, yeah. <laughs> the base of, of the glacier. In 1960, or in the 1960s, we uh, measured temperature in a winter ice furnace down to uh, minus, uh, down to 10 meters, and we found uh, places with cold. Uh, ice or cold snow, which obviously was coming from the winter cold and not permanent, mm -hmm. because there was still a, a change with time in, in, in depth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
seasonal cold layers. Mm -hmm. So, if any more questions, so two more from my side. Yes, if you allow. Uh, one's related to uh, the first uh, uh, part of your lecture. Uh, it was taking into consideration quite high uh, values of evaporation. Uh, do you have uh, 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 data from observation, from model? How do you deal with evaporation? In Svalbard, it's a real model um, uh, problem, uh, especially for glaciers. Gilak Kasa at our institute made his PhD thesis on hinterice Ferner, living in a tent and making evaporation measurements every six hours. Wow. And uh, that uh, has been repeated for short periods in other places. So we believe that the order of magnitude of 200 to 300 millimeters at an elevation of 3,000 meters is typical. Okay, so this is a good argument. Yeah. Usually some models are used taking into account uh, temperatures and uh, wind uh, and other factors. Taking, taking into account many variables that we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my last question is related to mentioned by you ancient old search uh, of, uh, as far as I uh, remember, Fernand Fernand, yeah? yeah. Uh, in uh, 1602 or something like that. Uh, I like very much spectacular uh, events. And any more surges in Alps? Could you uh, explain uh, your relation to this kind of interpretation? Was it surge or climatic advance? Uh, it was definitely a surge. It, it has been uh, it has been well studied after the flood of 1602. Mm -hmm. uh, it was re a repeated. Uh, advance or repeated surge in 1681. Mm -hmm. So uh, the population was uh, harmed by it, of course. Houses were destroyed. And uh, finally, uh, uh, Empress Maria Theresia sent a uh, professor of mechanics to the glacier in the advance of 1770. <laughs> or 72 and uh, he tried to uh, drill through the ice to make a channel for the water and he observed uh, and uh, recorded all details so this is definitely a, a very quick search and it can be modeled by the Bavarian Academy of Saints who is working on FANAP China they have, ah. they have um, this, this is really new yeah. for me, Elena. And you see, yeah. the, really. the reason uh, for this glacier to surge is that it has a small, uh, a narrow valley here, and it has a wide basin. Yeah. Keeping mass so in if, reserve. If for any reason, there is a, a step in here on the surface. If for any reason, this ice is accumulating without rapidly flowing, then one day it will flow rapidly. No, but we have to change for uh, 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 of climate to the other direction to have yeah, there's the, no this kind of the, phenomena the, in some future. The last uh, surge was 1816 or 17, not in 1850 anymore. No, thank you very much. Do we have other questions or comments? Now it's my privilege to welcome the Professor Ronskowska from Krakow who uh, is with us uh, for today. Thank you for coming. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Kuhn for the lecture, for coming to Poland. And I have some small souvenirs to you. One is related to the, our center, and this recently published uh, by colleagues from Warsaw, book on our station. Thank you, Mark, Mike, for coming here. Thank you very much. <laughs>